I'm Michael Paul Lindsay, former Union Pacific locomotive engineer for 17 years and active whistleblower in the railroad industry. All right. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of Working People, a podcast about the lives, jobs, dreams, and struggles of the working class today. Brought to you in partnership with In These Times Magazine and The Real News Network, produced by Jules Taylor, and made possible by the support of listeners like you. Working People is a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network, so if you are hungry for more worker and labor-focused shows like ours, follow the link in the show notes and go check out the other great shows in our network. And please, please, please support the work that we are doing here at Working People so we can keep growing and keep bringing y'all more important conversations with workers around the country and beyond every week. You can support us by leaving us positive reviews of the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You can share these episodes on your social media and share them around with your coworkers, your friends, and your family members. And of course, the single best thing you can do to support our work is become a paid monthly subscriber on Patreon for just five bucks a month. If you subscribe for 10 bucks a month, uh, you will also get a print subscription to the amazing In These Times magazine mailed to your home every month. Uh, If you haven't subscribed yet, but you want to get access to all of our great bonus episodes that we've published over the past six seasons, uh, we average about two new bonus episodes a month. Uh, Just head on over to patreon.com slash working people. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash working people. Hit the subscribe button and you'll immediately unlock a whole lot of awesome bonus content. Uh, and you'll be supporting the show um, because, you know, we, we've got thousands and thousands of folks who listen to the show every week. Uh, but as I've mentioned before, less than 1% of those listeners are actual Patreon subscribers. So they are really carrying the load for all of us and keeping the show going. So thank you all so, so much for supporting us. My name is Maximilian Alvarez, and we've got a really important episode uh, for you guys today. Um, you know, it's no secret to anyone who listens to the show or follows, uh, my work, uh, here or at the real news network over on breaking points, uh, or if you follow the great work of my colleague, Mel Buer, uh, you guys know that, uh, we have been very committed to covering the ongoing struggle, um, uh, uh, by railroad workers, um, across the freight rail industry here in the United States, uh, to, you know, fight against the wall street led corporate takeover and destruction of the industry and, you know, a vital component of our supply chain. You guys heard us all throughout the past year and a half interview railroad worker after railroad worker, We talked to conductors and engineers like Michael Paul Lindsay, our guest today. Um, We've talked to carmen. We've talked to maintenance of way folks. We've talked to dispatchers. You know, we've tried to give you guys uh, access to as many rank and file voices of the people who actually make this industry run. Uh, and this is an industry upon which basically every other industry depends. Like, you know, everything that you buy on the shelves at the supermarket uh, was on a railroad car at some point or another, right? And or virtually everything that you buy, right? And so this is why, obviously, so many people uh, got so invested uh, in the high stakes contract dispute between the 12 unions representing over 100,000 railroad workers in the freight rail industry and the and the class 1 freight rail carriers i.e. the companies that uh own you know the 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 railroads uh we watched all this play out last year i'm not going to run through the whole saga uh again i know you guys have heard me do so a number of times um but you know we 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 reported as much as we could on the issues that railroad workers uh, have been going through and like what their working conditions 
their their quality of life, uh, how or how much was left of it um, after years of corporate destruction of of this once good blue collar job. Uh, we talked about how those kind of uh, worsening working conditions for workers on the railroads were indicative of the larger sort of system change that has taken hold of the railroad industry. The same, you know, corporate philosophy that uh, focuses exclusively and intently on slashing operating costs year after year after year, cutting labor, cutting maintenance, cutting basic safety, necessary safety measures. Um all for the purposes of jacking up prices on shippers, uh, reducing labor costs, piling more work onto fewer workers, making their work more unsafe, more unbearable, making the trains longer and heavier and more unwieldy. Um, also that the railroads could end up in the position that they are currently in where they are raking in billions of dollars of profits every year. The, the railroad industry is more profitable than it has ever been. Um, stock buybacks, shareholder dividends, executive pay have all gone through the roof in recent years. Um, this is what the corporate led destruction of everything looks like in one industry, but I think one of the reasons that so many of us got so invested in this struggle is because we see in the railroads a tale of the destruction of our very society, right? Because these are the same arrayed forces that are, you know, destroying everything from Hollywood and, and, and the entertainment industry. Right now, you know, writers and potentially actors uh, are on strike fighting against very similar dynamics where, you know, the greedy... Uh, studios are destroying everything that we once loved about Hollywood so that they can maximize their profit and minimize their operating costs. We see this in healthcare with nurses and, and, and hospital staff going on strike, uh, fighting against the sort of, you know, just parasitic conglomerates that are owning so many of these hospitals and that are pushing nurses to the breaking point, uh, piling more work onto fewer people. Is this sounding familiar? Giving them untenable nurse to patient ratios so that they can't provide the quality of care that they were trained to give. And many of them are fleeing the industry or leaving hospitals that desperately need staff, just like is happening on the railroads. Railroad workers are quitting at record numbers because they can't take it anymore. So you guys get the point. The point that I'm making is that what, was ha what has been happening to the railroads is happening to so many other industries. It is happening. We are feeling the effects of it in so many other realms of our lives. And that is why, as always, we need to be there to support the workers who are actually taking a stand against this crap because the government isn't taking a stand against it. Corporations aren't going to change their ways out of the goodness of their own hearts if they even have hearts left. Uh, so it's got to be up to us. And um, I think, you know, we saw some really uh, hopeful signs of people rallying behind railroad workers like Michael Paul Lindsay. Um, but we still have a very long way to go. We are this is still very much a David versus Goliath story. And, you know, sadly, uh, Goliath has, you know, no qualms, no scruples, no shame when it comes to doing everything that uh, Goliath can to squash the Davids of the world, to silence workers, to um, force us into unsafe and, and um, untenable working conditions and just beat all will out of us so that we accept our subservient position in their grand profit-making scheme. And, you know, Michael Paul Lindsay, our guest today, um, has been a truly courageous freedom fighter in that regard. And I don't use those words lightly, right? Paul was instrumental uh, in the uh, contract dispute last year when so little was being reported on that contract dispute in the mainstream media, especially from the side of the workers um, Paul was out there being a whistleblower. Uh, he has built up a you know sizable following on TikTok. 
He was using that TikTok channel to communicate information to uh, other railroaders as well as the general public about what he and his fellow railroaders are going through on a day-to-day basis. Um, and then also we, I had the, the honor of interviewing Paul, uh, for breaking points. Um, you know, we, we've interviewed him at the real news network. Um, and you know, when, when I was doing the rounds, uh, you know, last September, uh, and then again, you know, when we were approaching a potential rail shutdown, um, in late November, early December, you know, Paul and I were, were, you know, doing the full court press, trying to get on as many other outlets and shows as we could to, to make sure that people knew what the hell was actually going on and why they needed, uh, to support workers like Paul. Um, and then, and it didn't stop there. We all know the story and I know I'm going on uh, a lot, but I promise we're going to, we're, I'm going to toss it over to Paul in a second, but I really want to make sure that everyone kind of like remembers the long kind of, uh, 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 march that we've had. Uh, over the past year and a half to get to the conversation that we're going to have today with Paul. Um, But we all know what happened in December. Uh, Scab Joe Biden, as well as Republicans and Democrats in Congress, uh, conspired to crush a potential railroad strike, uh, force a contract down workers' throats, essentially endorse all of the bad, greedy practices by the rail carriers, giving them no incentive whatsoever to change their ways uh, to address the issues that workers like Paul have been uh, whistleblowing about and screaming about to anyone who will listen. Uh, And then the mainstream media kind of moved on um, at the end of the year. And what happened on February 3rd, just a couple months later, East Palestine, Ohio, the catastrophic Norfolk Southern train derailment there which, as people who listen to this show know, um, has completely destroyed and upended the lives of everyone in that area, uh, including the the railroad workers who were on that train, right? And so if rail companies and the government had actually listened to people like Paul, they could have seen ca- a catastrophe like East Palestine coming, and they could have done more to prevent it. But alas, they did not. And that brings us to our conversation today, because Paul was there like he was last year during the contract fight. He was there posting updates on his TikTok channel. He was there whistleblowing about the conditions um, on the railroads that contributed to the avoidable catastrophes that we're seeing, like all the derailments around the country, including the catastrophic derailment in East Palestine. And how did Paul's employer uh, reward him for that, they fucking fired him, right? And we here at Working People, we at the Real News Network stand in solidarity with Paul. Uh, We, you know, uh, unquestioningly condemn what we see as a very clear cut case of retaliation for whistleblowing. Um, because, you know, everything that Paul has said has been in the public interest. He has a deep, deep level of expertise and experience in this industry. Uh, The information that he has been bringing to the public is information that the public deserves to know because these trains are going through our neighborhoods. They're going past our houses. They are causing damage to our communities like East Palestine and beyond. And so the public has a right to know these things. Paul has spoken nothing but the truth about the conditions on the railroads, and for that, he has been summarily fired by Union Pacific. And so that is the context of our conversation today. Uh, Paul, I'm incredibly sorry that you are going through this, uh, and we are sending nothing but love and solidarity to you, and I promise, listeners, we're going to dig into all of this insofar as we can um, given the kind of current and pending litigation, but we're we're here with this sort of exclusive one-on-one with Paul to sort of talk about his life and work on the railroads, uh, to to talk about you know where we are right now in this country in the rail industry and how his career over the course of the past seventeen years, right, he has seen the destruction of this industry. He has tried to do something to stop it. Um, and we're going to talk about, you know, what we can all do to stop uh, this, this, you know, silencing of him and other railroad workers who are trying to 
um, yeah, stop the destructive practices of this industry um, and and stop the public from enduring more destruction at the hands of the greedy rail carriers. So without further ado, and that's enough from me, I apologize for talking so long. I want to kind of come back to you, Paul. And before we get into all this shit, and 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 there's a lot to sh- a lot of shit to get into. You know, like I mentioned, you and I have done a lot of interviews together. We've we've texted, we've communicated throughout this whole saga. And like I said, you've been an invaluable source of of information throughout all of this. But we've never had you on the show to sort of do the full working people treatment and get to know more about your backstory and kind of how you came to work on the railroads, uh, how you came to be the person that you are. So let's let's do that first. I've been wanting to talk to you about this for a long time. So tell me about where you grew up and yeah, like just kind of like what what what, you know, life in in young Paul's world was like. Well, I I sure appreciate you having me on, Max. It's always great to do a segment with you and talk with you. And I I really and I appreciate the kind words. I feel kind of undeserving there. But um, yeah, I, I uh, grew up in several places, actually. It's kind of a weird story. I, most of my life growing up was in California, but I also lived back east in, in Georgia for a little bit, Tennessee for a little bit. But everywhere I lived as a, as a kid, um, I was always following the trains. I always loved the trains. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of funny stories related to it. I mean, I, I used to I uh, lived at my grandmother's house in Tifton, Georgia for a while. We would go on nightly walks. We'd always go by the Norfolk Southern line out there. And um, back in California, I used to watch the Southern Pacific trains prior to the merger going by. And I always loved the railroads, always wanted to work for the railroad, and always wanted to be an engineer. Um, and that, that continued my entire life. I, I just, and it wasn't just an obsession with trains necessarily. You know, I just, I really genuinely just loved the railroad, loved the industry. I even had uh, books on it. Like, for example, there was a book back in the 90s, uh, The Railroad, What It Is, What It Does. And it was all about the industry and, you know, how it works, the technological changes, uh, how, you know, rail cars are built and uh, detectors. And uh, it's just kind of a dated book now, but it still is very, um, you know, it's just one of the many books that, uh, I ingested over the years to kind of learn about the industry. Uh, I'm a huge follower of the history, the industry. I have a whole collection at home. It's actually in storage now. Yeah, books are in storage right now because I've been traveling, but um, I have quite a collection of railroad-related books, uh, especially Southern Pacific and uh, California-related. But um, I'm trying to have a good understanding of the, the industry and its history, where it's been and where it's going. And and I know that growing up, I always Um, I always would see lines that were abandoned or pulled out of service and, you know, wanted the industry to grow and hope they would, uh, there would be a need for them again. And and unfortunately, all I've seen all of these years, uh, from being a kid and from being working at the railroad myself is the railroad shrinking itself into effective oblivion, you know, uh, shrinking itself into almost obscurity as an industry now, while the rest of the world is developing technologically to actually modernize its rail systems into the future. And um, everywhere I've traveled to, I always try to kind of observe the the railroads from outsider perspective. Like uh, when I traveled to Ukraine a few years ago, and I got to see some of the trains going into the central station in Kiev. And uh, even they, you know, being this say maybe outdated rolling stock and uh, mode of power, they were still fully electrified and they ran a a very, very efficient operation. Um, And, and just this spring I was in Italy going 190 miles an hour on a train. (laughs) And it's, it's amazing to see. You didn't even need to, you didn't even need to look at a schedule because you just knew if you showed up at the station, there'd be a train leaving within 10 or 15 minutes. And um, it, it just works over there you know other countries are investing into their infrastructure and i i see how we have a highly consolidated uh rail system that is uh that has consolidated into larger and larger monopolies and throughout my career at the railroad which started in 2006 
Um, I've just seen more money be diverted from the physical plant of the railroad itself into stock buybacks. And I, you know, and then I've also seen this change in, in culture at the railroad. When I started No Six, uh, you could see it in their advertising campaigns. Um, you know, back then, companies like that still advertised. And I remember these commercials, these Union Pacific commercials. Um, they were building America was the slogan, you know, and we're still kind of running in the years after 9-11, the patriotic movement. And they put the American flags on their locomotives and they'd have the they have these commercials. You can still look them up on YouTube and, um, you know, just this deep voice of, you know, the narrator describing um describing their powerful history of building and growing the United States. And, and you see this train, you know, of the same colors of the sunset going across the screen into the distance and, you know, Union Pacific building America. And it, it made you proud to work for that company, you know, and over the years, that image has just gone away and they keep changing their image to not even care about their public image anymore, not care about growth not care about image. Um, I know maybe it's anecdotal, but it was just such a shame this last last year. I observed that I happened to be off for 4th of July, the parade. There were three different parades in Pocatello where I live. Um, and they had all the employers in town, all the big business. And here is Union Pacific, the largest, oldest employer in Pocatello. And they did not have any presence there. No pride in the community. They didn't even have a maintenance away truck with someone throwing candy. Nothing. And that is that's one of the one of the major cultural shifts that I've seen in the industry is just the disregard and contempt for the general public. Um, and and then also the share buybacks where they would happily divert money that could go into growing and modernizing, electrifying, um, becoming a 21st century railroad and diverting that into share buybacks. Every every single quarter, every single year for, I, I don't even know how many years now, but I've been following it. They, they consistently put more money into share buybacks than they do their infrastructure. Bridges, tracks, better rolling stock, electrification, um, better wages. They don't do it anymore. And it, it almost seems like the industry now that I love, and I, I love the industry, um, it seems like the industry that I love is, is ruled by people that would rather see the railroad eventually go bankrupt, fold into itself, and receive a bailout because they know it's too big to fail. They know they're just like the airlines, they're just like the banks. They can make any irresponsible business decision they'd like, and eventually they'll just be bailed out and given a golden parachute. The people responsible won't be held accountable. And that's what's been happening in the industry. And it's and it was this kind of shift that made me want to be vocal and speak out against what's been happening. And I, I knew the risk, and I knew that eventually they were going to come after me for it. I mean, I really did. There was no question about it. And, um, but it, it became more and more important to me because I cared about the survival of the industry and also how it was affecting safety for communities like East Palestine and every other community that, you know, Lac Magantique, we're 10 years past the Lac Magantique disaster in Canada. Um, and really, safety practices, maintenance practices, especially, have just essentially falling off a cliff. I want to hop in there for a second. Um, yep. cause like I have so many thoughts running through my head and, and I guess like before we, we kind of get, uh, deep into that, uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of jump back to, to something that you said earlier, um, before we get too far away from it. Cause I, I actually didn't know that you uh, grew up in California. So did I, where, like, were you in SoCal or are you in Northern California? Uh, Southern California. So, so same here. Uh, yeah. So uh, Ventura, I spent a lot of time in Ventura, California, and then also Paso Robles, California. I was there for uh, a little bit. I still have family in uh, the Central Coast, San Luis Obispo, uh, Tascadero, Paso Robles area there. Um, 
And I actually, I just spent three weeks down there. I, that's one of my favorite places in the entire world. And I'd, I'd live on the central coast again, if I could uh, justify it financially right now. But really what's been tying me to Idaho has been the railroad for uh, all this time because seniority has just helped me in Idaho. But California is where I started work at the railroad too. I, I started in Oakland in the fall of 2006. And that was uh, after I'd been deployed to Iraq and Marine Corps most of the year. And uh, after the deployment, dropped to the reserves and hired on for the railroad out of the Bay Area. I uh, worked for Union Pacific in San Luis Obispo for a while. It's such an interesting kind of um, chapter to your story because it yes. kind of hooks back to to my connection to this story as well. Um, because I remember, you know, I grew up in Orange County. Um, okay. and I was born in Upland, by the way. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. San Bernardino County, right next door. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, look at that. I, yeah, I, I kind of just associated you with with uh, with Pocatello. Um, but I'm loving I'm loving this uh, this Cali boy connection. But like what you what you described is something that really hits home literally for me, because I can remember um, seeing the kind of changes to my town growing up. Um, I've told the story, I believe, on this show that like. Um, I, I remember being young, but conscious of a fight happening in my hometown of Brea, California, uh, which was like, a, it, I mean, it, Brea, it's named after tar. Like there was, it was an oil boom town. Um, yes. there's still oil rigs dotting the hills that I, my brothers and I used to run around and climb on. Uh, it was ill-advised to do so, but like we would, you know, that was that. That's the landscape the of my childhood. Yeah, yeah, they're they're everywhere, and um and so like there was that history there, but I also remember there being like remnants of the the kind of old world of Brea. The the there were a couple of buildings left over from the 19th century, um, where I believe it was a a, a saloon and a bank that uh some people in town were trying to get the city to like give it historical status so that we could preserve those buildings. Uh, and they lost that fight and this, like it all got bulldozed. Maybe there's a plaque somewhere over there now, but it's like, now it's just a, it's like a shopping center. It's a promenade. There's no memory. Yeah. There's no memory of that history there anywhere. But like in that same vein, just down the road from there, if you keep going down that street, there was a rail line that passed uh, across from my junior high school. And I remembered the process of that rail line being in use to no longer being in use to just being like something that you would drive over to now it's paved over. And now it's, I think a bike path. And I'm not saying that that in and of itself is a bad thing. Maybe that rail line, you know, wasn't necessary, but it's still, it kind of like, it gave me this sort of sense of of the railroads as um yeah this sort of fading technology this sort of like the 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 progression into the future as far as the world that was around me was concerned like meant sort of phasing out the railroads um and it was that's what i came to this story with last year when i talked to you when i talked to Ron Kamenko, all the great folks at Railroad Workers United, Matt Parker, right? All all the homies, um, Jeff Kurtz. Uh, it, that was all rattling around in my in my brain, and then it kind of became clear to me that it was like, oh, like that that wasn't just like that wasn't a natural progression. In fact, railroads can and should be part of our future, but like. What I was actually witnessing without realizing it was what you just sort of described, like the kind of slow destruction of a vital industry, not because of technological progress, but for, you know, uh, uh, increasing profits for executives and shareholders. That, that was definitely part of it, but it began long before that, because uh, you see, if you go back to uh, the 60s and 70s, um, we also started building subsidized highway systems and interstates in the United States. And, and I'm not um, criticizing entirely interstate highways and everything. I, I love them. I, I love traveling on them. Um, but 
we kept the same regulatory structure on the railroads during that time. And it wasn't until the Staggers Act in the 1980s where they actually allowed the railroads to um, shed some of these regulations. But those regulations are also very misunderstood as well. So um, I've had this discussion with a lot of old time railroaders that try to say, because the guys I hired on with hired on in the 60s, and they try to say, oh, if they'd only re-regulate the railroads back to the way they had it, you know, that would have fixed our, our problems, but not necessarily. I mean, these, these regulations that were in place before were actually created by the railroads themselves. It's like, it's almost like businesses never really change. They're always looking for ways to monopolize and control the market and to not have to compete with each other. So if you go back historically, um, there, there was a time when railroads in the late 1800s were adamantly competing at each other's throats because they had been overbuilt, because they had been subsidized uh, by all kinds of different governments because every community wanted a railroad at the time. And there were some markets that were just ridiculously um, oversaturated, like there were about eight or 10 different ways to get a load of freight from Omaha to Chicago on, t on different railroads. Um, so they didn't want to compete with each other because they wanted to be profitable. So they kept trying to make underhanded agreements with each other, enforcing rates, but they weren't enforceable by law because of antitrust law. You can't do that. Um, so they lobbied to form the Interstate Commerce Commission and to have the government set their rates, to basically set a fair rate saying that if you haul a car load of this type from this point to this point, this is how much it's going to cost. And it made it to where they didn't have to compete. They could just operate like a big cozy cartel, right? And that worked great for a long time because you didn't have trucks. You didn't have planes. The, the trains were the only game in town. But fast forward to the end of the 20th century, and those regulations were still in place. Meanwhile trucks and planes and government subsidized highway systems could um, undercut them and were not regulated to such an extent. So a lot of railroads went bankrupt during that time. And it's such a shame because there's just beautiful marvels of modern railroad engineering, like, for example, the Milwaukee Road going across Washington and Montana through Butte and um, Missoula and up and over uh, the pass into Avery, Idaho, and across Washington and Snoqualmie Pass and beautiful tunnels and trestles. It was the last major transcontinental railroad to be built, was built to the highest standard. And yet in 1980, they abandoned the entire thing, all the way from Miles City, Montana to Tacoma, Washington. And you can bike on it now. There's a, a bike path on the Montana-Idaho border called the Route of the Hiawatha wonderful experience if you're ever up there. You, but uh, you, you bike over these huge trestles and you started out by going through a couple mile long tunnel from the Montana side and emerging on the Idaho side. Uh, you got to have headlights on your bike. It's pitch black in the middle of it. Um, <laughs> but you, you ride down it and you see these beautiful pieces of, of engineering marvel that the rail industry built, right? Um but as these as these railroads consolidated out of um, they, they consolidated out of necessity, they needed to, and they became bigger and bigger and bigger. And now, over the last you know decade or two, um, especially with interest rates falling and, and monetary policy favoring bailouts and borrowing money, so they've joined into the whole let's borrow money so we can buy back our own shares nonsense and just let the industry fall, just like everyone else. Um, but we're starting to see, um, you know, we're starting to see an industry now like that's resembling what you talked about growing up in uh, Southern California and seeing a line that was active, transition to not being active, transition to be a bike path. Um, there's a lot of Americans that believe that the rail industry is antiquated and out of date. Um, and to a degree it is. However, um, what, they're, what they really need to realize is that um, you'd be saying the same thing about the aviation industry or about the highway industry if no major improvements had occurred since the 1960s. I mean, if, if we hadn't made any highway investments or any investments in new airplanes or new anything since the 1960s, people would be saying that infrastructure is out of date too. 
but that's that's because we don't we don't really put money into it. Um, and and I guess that kind of transitions us to what I've been a question I've been asking is why do we tolerate this? Why do we tolerate allowing our vital infrastructure, and it's more vital than people realize, to deteriorate like this? And it clearly has no place being entirely held in, to, in private hands anymore. It, it's kind of like, look at our, our freeway system. It's constantly being uh, rebuilt. Uh, bridges are being rebuilt, modernized, updated with uh, higher speed interchanges and turnouts. Same thing with our airport system. Um, yeah, it's not perfect but it is constantly being modernized and constantly having capital put into it because we know that if we are to function as a civilization, we need a functional transportation system. That's simply not happening to any significant extent in the rail industry. Um, and it's, it's going to be to our own detriment as a country. So um, all in that, that thought process by, by asking, you know, your listeners here. So we have, Tons of trucking companies operating along the interstates, right? Every day, and they're private companies. And it's not a perfect system, but they compete and it works, right? Um, but no one's suggesting that a trucking company should own the Interstate 40. And that would be that would be ridiculous. If we were to suggest, hey, we should privatize an interstate, that would be nuts. No one would support that. But yet that's what we're doing in the rail industry. Yeah. Now the the, the more that I talk to you know, workers like yourself and learned about, yeah, just the sort of Frankenstein's monster setup that we have with our rail system. Um, and then I started talking to like rail workers in other countries, like the RMT mm -hmm. folks in the UK, and they were comparing their system to ours. And they were like, wait, like the companies own the rail lines over there. <laughs> like, it's like, how does that fucking work? And I was like, I don't know, man. <laughs> like, uh, it, apparently it doesn't. Well it doesn't. Yeah. The answer is it doesn't. Um, and we could be, and and you're right. I think like that it, it, it has this crushing effect on our imaginations where if you go so long with a system set up like this, people just start to, you know, accept that there's no other way to do it. And there are, yep. they're like, that's one of, I mean, this is the kind of American exceptionalism problem, right? It's like, if you keep telling yourself that you're the apex of everything in the whole <laughs> world and you don't look at what the rest of the world is doing, you're not going to realize how much we're all getting fucked over. We could have a much exactly. better rail system in this country. We should be demanding it because and, we deserve it. And, and that's why when you bring up passenger rail, and bring up how it works in other countries. Uh, so many people just, it's its like you're talking in a foreign language. They don't even understand because they've never seen it. And they don't even question like, um, oh, back to your deal with uh, uh, Brea and those old buildings and those old parts of town that existed. And then they tore it, tore it down to build a shopping center. Um, so many Americans just can't imagine because they've never traveled abroad. They can't imagine an area where you don't have a, Dirty Strode. Um, I don't know if you know what that is. Uh, dirty <laughs> Strode with lots of traffic, and all the traffic is stopped, and it's dangerous with uh, strip malls and big box stores lining. It's it's not natural. It's not the way of natural human development that, that humans have developed for thousands of years, and it's not natural to other countries, <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. especially especially when you leave North America, it's kind of a, it's kind of a uniquely North American problem because Canada has that problem as well with the sprawling car based development for everything. But uh, yeah, yeah, if you've man. never seen it, then they're, you're not going to understand it. You're not going to understand it. And like, again, this is why it's so important for people to hear your side of the story and not just uh, the, the company side, which like, you know, in the media, if we hear about these issues at all, we generally only hear about the company side. Like, and and I, I wanted to kind of um, talk a bit about your experience, like as a worker in that industry. Again, like we're we're working our way up to the kind of clusterfuck that you and I were talking about all through last year and, you know, the, the, the union Pacific firing you for whistle blowing about it. Um, but before we get there, I want to go back to a young Paul, a veteran coming off deployment, going up to Oakland and starting to work on the railroads. Like what, 
What was that like? You know, I, 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 I granted like after doing so many interviews with railroaders over the past year and a half, I actually do feel like our, our listeners have a bit more of a sense of like what you guys do every day. Um, but I still feel like I'm learning new stuff every time I ask this question. So like, I guess just walk us through like your first few days, weeks, months, like what does that job entail? Um, how did you acclimate to it? And and then let's talk about how you have seen those changes take hold over the past 17 years and like what those changes translated to for you and other workers on the railroads themselves. Okay. Um, well, uh, first few days, weeks, uh, my first introduction to the railroad. Um, I know I, I did my interview session. Uh, you know, it started out with a hiring session uh, where they had a whole room full of people that had been called in. We were in uh, the upstairs floor at the Jack London Inn in Oakland, Jack London Square. And um, there was a whole room full of people. And this this whole story here will show you the difference in um, the standard that the railroad used to try to set on new hires versus today. So the first thing they always did is try to scare everyone in the room away from the line of work. They, they tell you, Oh, you're, you're going to be working every holiday, every weekend. Uh, you're going to be on the job nonstop. Your wife's going to divorce you. Your kids are going to hate you. You're going to develop an alcohol problem. You're going to, you know, everything else. They just, tried to do everything in the world to get people to scatter and the room just slowly emptied more and more. The people that were left, they give a reading comprehension test. And that was one of the first things you passed. And the reason for that is because we operate on the general code of operating rules. And that describes how you keep trains from hitting each other. They're both running both directions on uh, the same track. So you've got to have very specific very unambiguous ways of describing how these movements are to take place so the trains don't hit each other. And so the first thing they do is they give you reading comprehension, uh, a reading comprehension test. And then after that, uh, we went to lunch and they told us uh, they'll call you if you're to come back for an interview. And when it was all said and done and they called people back to interview, there were only like five or six people left. So wow. that used that was the initial weed out process and the way it always was back then. They had very, very high standards. Um, anyway, uh, long story short, I started class up in Roseville, California. And a uh, stupid memory. I'd just gotten back from Iraq. I was, uh, you know, I hadn't driven in a long time and it rained that morning. And, um, Oh man, I had just about, just about rear ended somebody, you know, sliding <laughs> on the, on the rain. I forgot how to drive apparently during the, my deployment, but I uh, made it in there on time, fortunately, because, um, they had a, they, they, no questions asked. If you showed up late the first day, you were, you were done. You're automatically gone. If, even if it was 30 seconds late, I saw that happen to a few people. They showed up 30 seconds late the first day. And they're like, sorry, we're not interested. You can leave. Wow. So that was the kind of high standard that was set. Fortunately, I was very punctual. So, and I've always been that way throughout my career. Um, not I. So, uh, <laughs> the, the, so, so I guess my my imagination uh, of like I've I've often thought I was like, man, what if I. What if I ended up working on the railroads? What would that look like? Uh, Apparently, you just gave me my answer. I wouldn't have made it past the interview phase because the Alvarez's are a famously unpunctual people. (laughs) Well, you know, the standards have dropped a lot because they've run all of their employees off and so many people have quit or uh, retired early or just left. And that's why they're giving out these big hiring bonuses now. And they were, it's unbelievable. They're trying to go to federal regulators and get the FRA to sign off on doing a lot of the training remotely now in class or or, or like on, on a zoom call, you know, do online training for your new hire stuff. um, Which obviously you're not going to be able to observe people properly, weed them out or anything. They just, the amount of safety standards for new hires 
they've just thrown it out the window because all they want is to hit their 55 operating ratio. That's all they care about now. Um, And so, yeah, nowadays, punctuality probably wouldn't matter. You'd probably be able to skate right through it. (laughs) <laughs> so well well after again after talking to you guys i think i'm fucking good like you know, I, after seeing after seeing what you guys have been through and the way that this industry treats its workers i'm all set but um like like i want to talk about that and like yeah like keep keep going keep tugging on yeah. this thread tell us tell us more about the kinds of um like what goes into being an engineer and the kind of routes you would take kind of things you'd haul and and yeah like um when and how you started seeing that standard that high standard that the industry was setting for you and the people that it hired uh started to change well most of my career i worked as a conductor um she and the conductor you know works uh, as the second person on the crew, they're the ones in charge of the train. So everything behind the locomotives back, uh, also everything that needs to be done on the ground, uh, adding cars to the train, removing cars from the train, switching cars, uh, communicating with the engineer, speed restrictions and everything else. Um, but taking engineer promotion is the next promotion. It took me eight years to have enough seniority to take that promotion. Um, and it was a long eight years waiting because I just I was itching to you know get over there and and <laughs> learn how to run trains you know and um, so definitely my career changed for from a personal enjoyment perspective a lot more when I uh, got to finally go to take my engineer promotion I did during my time as a conductor I got to do uh, an immense amount of things during that time I worked in a lot of places worked all over California. How I ended up in Pocatello was we were kind of in the early phases of the slowdown before the financial crisis in the fall of 2007 now. And you always see slowdowns on the railroads first. It, they start to slow down first before everything else does. And they were looking for people uh, around the country in different places. And they called and said, I put in my name to transfer somewhere else because I didn't want to get furloughed. And they said, uh, well, do you want to go to Pocatello? And so I gave up my seniority, started my seniority over in Pocatello. And uh, that's how I ended up there. But since then, I've temporarily worked in Chicago, worked in San Antonio, worked in parts of Utah, Elko, Nevada, Grand Junction, Colorado, been a lot of places. Um, But uh, when I finally got to take engineer promotion, that is when you really, really... um, you just become a much better employee, I think, as an engineer. Um, not maybe employee is the wrong way to put it, but a better a better railroad because engineer training was intense. Um, it's intense for various for various reasons. For one, um, if you are a conductor and you have a whole career in front of you, there's a lot of people that just never take promotion because they're not interested and they stay conductors forever. If you take engineer promotion and you fail out of it, you don't have a job anymore. You can't go back to being a conductor. So that's the first thing is when you take promotion, you just know that you need to pass it. If you want to have a career, you need to pass it because once you start, you're committed. And it was a solid six months of working nearly nonstop. And part of the training was down in Salt Lake. And this was your classroom and simulator training. We went there two different times. And I really, I really enjoyed Salt Lake in a lot of ways. It was interesting. They had one room uh, that was devoted all to air brakes and all of the subsystems of air brakes. And I thought I understood the air brake system and rail cars beforehand. But after that, it had like a, a full miniature setup. By miniature, I mean it had all the full life-size parts of the locomotive, the control console, the brake cylinders on the cars, but all consolidated into about 20 feet going across the room. So it basically simulated having two locomotives and two freight cars and end a train device on the rear and all the moving parts. And you could play around with a full real-size control console and, and see how all the systems function together. Um, you learn very, very in-depth into g core rules. And then part of your day, so g core and air brake rules, all the rules that we operate by, um, 
and all the context, every sort of scenario and context and maybe scenarios that you didn't understand because you've never seen before related to just weird situations. Um, and then part of your day was classroom and the other part of the day was, was simulator. And every day was a scenario. And you learned about, you got the paperwork the day before of the scenario, how big your train is, your max speed limit, your tonnage, and what line you're going to be on. And, um, you know, they would try to compete. You'd compete for um, speed, uh, fuel efficiency, and, um, you know, also on train handling because it rates all of your uh, draft and um, your um all your all of your draft which is your pulling force and your buff which is your compression force and your all of your other lateral and vertical forces it counts all that and measures you and pumps out a score but there's also an fra score your license score which if uh, you do something that's an fra decertifiable offense in there it zeroes out that score and you automatically fail it but they try they intentionally try to do that to you and everyone gets decertified on the simulator while they're there because that's the place to do it is to learn. And then you never forget that rule again. Um, so um, I remember one day in particular and it was a scenario and they hyped us up. They're like, Hey, so tomorrow it's about, it's a speed run and you're trying to get, we're going to measure you on distance covered and time and we're going to compete and whoever gets the highest score, you know, they're going to win a prize basically. And so they're distracting us on the the prize and i spend all this time at home trying to learn this route i even looked it up on google maps and in up timetables and tried to learn the speeds on this segment and was all ready to go and uh man i started it, it the scenario started the train was already moving about 15 miles an hour and i'm like okay i'm in a permanent 60 mile an hour i'm gonna get it up to speed well i forgot we hadn't seen a signal yet so per the G core rules, you were initiating movement and you have to be at what's called restricted speed until your leading wheels pass the first governing signal that remove, re relieves you from being at restricted speed. Um, it's a catch all rule. I'll, I won't go into depth on that, but it's a, it's one of the most important rules we have. Um, and somehow I, I missed that. I'm all focused on the speed because they're intentionally trying to distract you. And man, I thought I was doing great. I'm zipping along and okay, I got this 40 mile an hour curve coming up. I'm going to set some air and get down port. My instructor comes behind me. How you doing? So uh, what was your last signal? And that's when it hit me. <laughs> wow. God damn it. <laughs> I, I, just, I just failed the simulator. <laughs> and I still had to go through the whole thing, you know. Um, and But that's trying to simulate like, distractions coming up you're going along down the rail and you know something comes up on the radio and radio communication going on and you know a car coming up on a crossing that looks like they're not going to stop and a speed change coming up and maintenance away workers coming up ahead and a form a speed restriction and a form b all these overlapping distractions they're trying to do that so but then you go come back to pocatello and you do months and months of working as a student engineer with a qualified engineer and you're just back to back to back nonstop. And also during this time, it's a pay cut. You actually take a pay cut while you're doing the training. Um, but uh, during this time, I remember losing a lot of sleep because um, I, I would constantly have dreams that like there's a red signal coming up and I'm trying to find the brakes and I can't find them in bed and I can't, and, and it's getting closer and closer. It was, it was enough to give you nightmares during engineer training. Yeah, that's Jesus. how I remember. <laughs> you come out well, such a better employee. Yeah, man, I'm uh, I'm like breaking out into a cold sweat just thinking about this, and like, and you know, I think like a number of things jump out, right? Like, is one just like like this is also what we were saying during the you know the high stakes contract dispute last year, right? And I guess just a reminder for everyone: by the time we were talking about that contract dispute. Uh, the contract was already three years out of date, right? I mean, this was three years into the negotiations, but because of all the provisions within the Railway Labor Act and all the funky conditions um, around bargaining uh, between the rail unions and rail carriers, 
Um, we're not going to go into all that. Again, you guys can go back and check out our past uh, interviews to get more up to date on that. But because of all that weirdness, like this, this kind of contract dispute had been going on for a long time. You know, the more that I would talk to uh, workers like yourself, um, the more that it was just baffling to me that people like you could go through that much training and that you could be expected to hold within yourself on any given day that much knowledge and um, sort of like uh, scenarios upon scenarios for how to act in a situation while still staying in compliance with federal regulations, with company rules, with uh, the the size of the train you got, the kind of train you got, the crew that you got, like it just feels like it, it kind of reminded me of um, when uh, two homies who uh, we've had on the show before as well, the great Zach Patton and um, uh, Skiff from um, the Longshore Workers um, in Tacoma. Um, when Zach and Skiff were on the show, they were describing to me this kind of practice that they have in the Tacoma port that's kind of particular to them where, um, you know, they, they, they load these uh, ships that are docking there and are on their way to Alaska. And so you got these guys in like forklifts, like a, a small army of forklifts, like zipping up and down these ramps and in these tight quarters and stacking it as tightly as you can. And it just, what, hearing them describe it was like anxiety producing for me. Cause I was like, I don't know how you act in that situation. I would be so terrified by what could go wrong that I would end up causing an accident because you almost have to like, you have to have that sort of state of flow. You have to be so intimately connected to that machinery yes. and so well versed in that knowledge that it becomes kind of instinctual and you're, you're, you're able to like always be aware of the safety risk, but not be immobilized by them. I don't know. Like Repetition. I just have so much tremendous. Yeah. The tremendous respect I have for you and others who are able to do that is off the charts, which is why I guess this is the point I'm making. It was so baffling to me to hear that the railroads have been cutting their staff uh, year after year after year. And that in fact, they were trying to make that job harder for you guys by you know, getting crews on trains that used to have like five people down to two and then possibly down to one. And I was like, how the fuck does any of that make sense? Yeah. Well, while at the same time, also uh, running longer and longer trains that usually don't make it across the territory in the designated time uh, allowed. So a trip that may have taken seven hours in the past is now consistently taking 12 hours plus while you wait for another crew to come out and relieve you. Um, I, I will touch on one thing there, Max. You mentioned about the labor dispute, you know, kind of hitting that a little bit and how you mentioned earlier how Biden uh, collaborated with big business to basically prevent us from strike, a work stoppage, you know, and the media talked all about a strike and the potential of a railroad strike. Um, but actually, because it, it's railroaders are not allowed to strike. It's, it's uh, you know, against the law. They can force us back to work, which in a supposedly free country just seems obscene to even discuss that. But um, so there it's it doesn't the language of it does not specifically refer to a strike though it refers to a work stoppage so being a strike from the labor side or a lockout from the railroad side and i'm going to be one of the people that uh, one of the only people that has said this and that is that there was an illegal work stoppage it did occur but it wasn't the employees that did it it was companies like union pacific and norfolk southern that several days before the strike was even legal started shutting down ports and saying, oh, this is in anticipation of a potential strike and an orderly shutdown. They illegally broke the law and shut, started shutting down the U.S. economy before the, the allotted date where we would be allowed to do that. And no one talked about it. 
Well, and like just to like kind of contextualize that for listeners, because what what Paul just said is is really important. Um, and you're right; it was it, it was driving me insane uh, on this end, on the media side, hearing so many outlets that had paid no attention to this struggle until like we were literally at the 11th hour in September of 2022, um, and we were at that moment when uh, a rail shut down like could potentially happen to your point and like i said i won't run everyone through my whole spiel on the railway labor act and all the stages that we had to clear in order for a strike or a lockout to become legal like paul said but because labor relations on the railroads are not governed by the national labor relations act they're governed by the railway labor act which was uh passed in the 1920s with the explicit purpose of preventing the kind of railroad strike that this country had seen in the early 20th and late 19th centuries, they we railroad workers like Paul and 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 his uh, you know ancestors on the in the industry, they showed corporate America the business class and uh, their lackeys in D.C. and state houses across the country, they showed how much power workers on the railroads had to bring the economy to its knees, and they exerted that power uh, multiple times, um, which is why, you know, the kind of ruling business and political establishment was like, all right, we need to create this whole other separate set of rules, uh, which became the Railway Labor Act, kind of like essentially making it next to impossible for workers in this industry and other affiliated industries industries that, you know, are vital to our national security supply chain, yada, yada, yada. Like we need to make it as hard as possible for work stoppages to happen here. Right. So that's why we went through all those fucking stages last year. There were the negotiations that reached an impasse. There was a federal mediator who came in when they declared an impasse that started a 30 day cooling off period. Biden had the opportunity in that period to uh, 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 create a presidential emergency board to review the the um, kind of contract dispute from both sides, labor and management. Uh, They offered their recommendations. They put together a report in uh, late August. That triggered another 30-day cooling off period uh, uh, during which the unions and the carriers like would would have an opportunity to uh, you know say whether or not they could agree uh, to that report as the framework for a new contract. So what Paul was just talking about is in September when we were reaching the end of that 30 day cooling off period after the PEB, the Presidential Emergency Board, had released its official report that uh, and its recommendations for the framework for a new contract, the rail carriers immediately said, yeah, that sounds good to us, right? So that should tell you right there why, you know, it was such a bad uh, uh, report or what was missing from it. The rail unions, uh, not so much. There was a lot of internal debate. A couple of the unions said that they would accept it as a as a, uh, the framework for a new contract. Others did not. All the while, the clock was ticking down to late September when, after the end of that 30-day cooling off period, that is like the last stage in the Railway Labor Act, at which point now a lockout initiated by the rail carriers or a strike initiated by any one of the unions could effectively and legally um, happen. And so uh, the railroad unions and the workers, like Paul was saying, like they had to sit and wait. They couldn't start a strike before that 30 day deadline uh, was exhausted. Uh, they would get fired. They like there's a whole lot of consequences if labor jumps the gun um, and, and, and kind of like starts a work stoppage uh, before the Railway Labor Act says that they can. And yet. The rail carriers, a week before that 30-day deadline was up, started, um, yeah, like doing slowdowns, started embargoing freight, started closing down lines. They started a uh, like they started holding the rest of the economy hostage by violating the, the Railway Labor Act. Um, and like no one in the media was calling them on it. And it was it was insane. They should have been criminally held liable for that. Because they would have held us criminally liable had we started a strike early. Yeah. 
No, I mean, it just, again, it just showed how stacked the deck is here. Um, you know, and 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 just in terms of like, yeah, like the 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 business side's willingness to flout the law because they know they can get away with it. But also, like I said before, the fact that you guys were going up against a, a corporate media ecosystem that is so deeply entrenched in business friendly ideology, anti worker ideology, right? I mean, like we've all like it, it was just you know so infuriating to me that that you and your fellow worker whistleblowers had to fight so hard just to get a countervailing perspective in there and to even make points like these because the pundits didn't know that shit they had no idea what they were talking about it took me and mel buer a whole year of interviewing workers to gain the like basic level of competency that we had to try to explain it to other people. And so I could go on all day about this, but like, I want to, I want to kind of like hook that into uh, kind of like our final round in this conversation. Cause I want to make sure we give ample time to talk about um, kind of the situation that you are in now and what people can do to support you. But this is important because in many ways, the situation you're in now is linked to um, the whistleblowing that you were doing during that time when we were approaching a potential rail shutdown. Um, and you were, uh, like I said, posting on your TikTok, you were doing interviews, you've written op-eds for uh, industry magazines like Railway Age, you know, like you, you, you have, and you've been, I think, a really fair uh, a critic of, of the industry, but it's, it's always been clear from your writing, from your speaking, how much you love the industry, how much you care uh, about your fellow workers and their ability to do the job that you were hired to do, uh, what, you know, the, the, potential that you know that the railroads have um, and also the danger that the, you know, uh, a, a corporate Wall Street led practices uh, pose to uh, the rest of, you know, the, the country. Right. So I wanted to ask if you just say a little bit about that side of things, like when we were in year three of the contract dispute. Some people are like like myself, Mel, in these times, other outlets, people are starting to get involved. Um, so what was going through your mind in terms of like seeing where the industry was, seeing how little people outside of the industry understood that and like what you felt compelled to do to try to raise people's awareness about that, right? I mean, because I guess the the final thing I'll say there, then I'll shut up is like just from my side, I will I will tell people listening to this, it was not easy to get connected with railroad workers like Paul. It took a lot of work because initially the first story I reported on was in late January of 2022 when I had learned that BNSF railway workers, um, this, this was, um, Specifically, the conductors and engineers were prepared to go on strike against BNSF Railway over the institution of a new draconian attendance policy called high vis. Um, and a district court blocked the a district court judge blocked workers from striking, allowed the policy to go into effect. So that was kind of a prelude to what we would see happen uh, with Biden and Congress and so on and so forth. So I tried to connect with people at that point, And all I heard from workers was like, I'll talk to you off the record, but you cannot use my name. You, you, for the love of God, please don't tell anyone that you spoke to me because I will get fired. So right off the bat, it was very clear to me. It was like, this is an industry that um, is so kind of tightly controlled from the top down that the rank and file voices are being actively silenced um, and that the public is not aware of the danger it is in because of that regime of silencing. And that is the, those are the conditions under which Paul himself took a really big risk. And like, like I said, wrote op-eds, gave public interviews, posted on his TikTok. So that's, that's kind of the, the, the sort of context here. Now, Paul, take it away from there and talk us through your own sort of process for, for why you felt you had to blow the whistle, uh, on what you were seeing and what that entailed, what you felt you needed the public, the public needed to know. Yes. Well, it's been, it's been very difficult to convey the message to a lot of people because the, the media, you know, certain sides of the media, um, and then also the railroads themselves and just 
I, I would say this uh, general gaslighting that workers get around the country, um, they've convinced people that it's totally cool to just criticize each other and bring each other down like, oh, you're already overpaid as is, you know, and try to get much empathy from people that just do not understand the context of what we're talking about. So it's hard to break past that uh, brick wall of what's going on. And like you said, talking with railroad workers that are willing to talk is very hard because, um, you know, the, th these are the same industries. These are the same companies um, that, you know, oppressed racial groups that, you know, willingly were totally cool with paying the Chinese less and letting them die on the job, getting blown up in tunnels and on rock faces. This is the same industry that just a few short decades ago was totally cool with uh, preventing women and preventing African-Americans from getting promoted and kind of keeping African-Americans in uh, low-paid porter and waiter pr uh, positions and not letting them promote. I mean, these are the same companies that did this, and they are totally cool with silencing you and oppressing you and firing you or worse. I mean, it's kind of funny. I was making all these TikTok videos and everything. And there was uh, one of my coworkers said, hey, well, when something happens to you, I'm going to make a bunch of money. I'm going to sell T-shirts that say that Michael Paul didn't kill himself <laughs> <laughs> in relation, implying that the railroad's going to off me. <laughs> so this is, this, is, Jesus, man. this is the mentality of these railroads that are perfectly OK with with intimidating people that would dare to speak out against what they're doing, uh, anyone that would dare speak out against their business practices or anything else. Um, and this isn't the first time that I uh, spoke out against them. I mean, I'll give you an example. This is about, about five years ago. It was before anyone started talking about uh, what's been going on with the bailouts and the share buybacks and everything else. If you go back about five years ago, uh, the executive leadership at Union Pacific had a town hall meeting in Pocatello at the depot. And uh, Lance Fritz, the CEO, and at the time, Rob Knight, the CFO, they were all there. And in front of everyone, I asked him why they were feeling it necessary to uh, deplete our resources and to not invest in the railroad's future growth and to de destroy our capital by buying back their own shares to such an extent. And they basically gave me the most polite screw you I've ever gotten in my life and uh, talked down to me like I'm stupid. But, you know, I have a business degree. I'm not stupid. I know what share buybacks are, and I know how they're financing their share buybacks. I called them out about it back then. Um, but now people are starting to, uh, it's hitting the mainstream. People are talking about it. And so I've kind of focused on, uh, you know, the Wall Street issue with the railroads and how they're owned, just like so many companies in this country, by BlackRock and Vanguard and State Street that try to squeeze every every penny out of them, regardless of which industry it is and whether it even survives long term. Um, but uh, train length and uh, the amount of staff on hand to service uh, these trains was definitely a huge factor. Um, so the railroads act like running longer and longer trains is just as safe as running shorter trains. Uh, but what it's actually doing a lot of times is pull blocking communities, blocking crossings, and uh, between that tied with cutting locomotive maintenance staff and also cutting carmen, car maintenance staff, it's creating a lot, of a lot of stress on the supervisors and the employees in those roles. So if, let's say, a 6,000-foot train comes into the terminal, it's pretty easily to comply with federal law and service that train and ensure that it's safe to go to get it out of town. Um, and to spend, you know, a proper amount of time per each car. But if that's a 14,000 foot train, like they like running, and they've cut the car staff down and they don't have as many, um, then it is very, very tempting to rush through that train and get it done and get it out of the terminal and send it on to the next because, God, we're going to get, I'm going to get my ass chewed if I don't get this train out of here. And that is a, a very real uh, human action result of forcing these 14,000 foot trains through. Um, also, it, it feels like they're conducting unregulated experimentation on the public because 
these trains do break down more. They do run over the track slower. They run over any territory slower. And um, like, imagine if you have a 10 mile section of track and there's a, you know, 40 mile an hour curve at both ends of this 10 mile section, right? But you have a 14,000 foot train, almost three miles long. And you, your, your train's good for 60, but you have 40 mile an hour curves on both ends of this 10 mile section. You cannot pick it up to 60 until your very last car comes out of that 40 mile an hour curve, which is almost three miles. Then it's going to take a few miles to get back up to 60 again. And then you're going to have to slow back down to 40 again. So you might as well just go about 43, 44 miles an hour through that whole section, because by the time you get out of that 40 mile an hour section, you're almost up to another one. So the trains are moving slower. People's goods are moving slower across the system. And it's an unregulated experiment on the economy because people need their goods. You know, we're seeing high inflation and um, you know, the, the railroads do play a part. In that. They've also, um, you know, they've farmed out their maintenance. Uh, so something that was going on with the East Palestine thing, and this was something that they specifically brought a TikTok video that I made. They they magically decided to fire me right as East Palestine was coming along because I released a video on East Palestine. And that was one of five videos they used in their investigation of A5 TikTok videos uh, that I'd made. And specifically talking about East Palestine, and I feel like they really wanted to just silence me because East Palestine was making the entire industry look bad. And I made a video about how these hot box detectors are being silenced. So a hot box detector is a detector in the track every 10, 15, sometimes 20 miles. And as the train goes by, it measures the temperature on the bearings and determines uh, whether the bearing is overheating. And it's always sent, it sends a message over the radio at the end of the train after it goes by, uh, gives a mile post, no defects, usually an actual count of speed and sometimes the ambient temperature outside. And it gives that information so the crew is constantly aware of what's going on. Well, in the last few years, they've been silencing these messages and they're not regulated. These detectors, I thought that maybe there were federal uh, rules governing these detectors, just like there's federal standards on everything. But somehow, what has come out with this East Palestine thing, the biggest thing that they're wanting everyone to shut up about is that hot box detectors do not have a fixed standard. There's no standard how far apart they need to be. There's no standard as to how they need to be calibrated. There was no fixed standard. So it was people like me talking about this that got people really looking into that and wanting to talk about why the hot box detectors were being silenced. Well, what they were doing is they were silencing these detectors. And if, say, uh, an alarm for a high temperature bearing went off, um, it would go to Omaha, like where the headquarters UP is, or you know whatever the headquarters is on the other railroads, it would go to their headquarters, to their bearing desk. Someone would review it and determine whether it was worthwhile to report it to the actual crew. I mean, that, that would be like, being on a plane and they say there's an engine alarm that goes off and it goes to the airline headquarters and they determine whether they need to tell the pilots about it. It's ridiculous. It is. So, I mean, it, it, it is like, it is like, and you're, I'm so glad that you brought this up, right? Because this was, was also news to me that I learned by watching the, uh, the, the surface board trans, the surface transportation board hearings on East Palestine that just happened. I, I was watching Jason Cox, the national rep for the Brotherhood of Railway Carmen on CSX and Norfolk Southern give his testimony saying what you're saying. And, and like then the industry or the Norfolk Southern representative effectively revealing that these hotbox detectors are not federally regulated. Uh, it's the it's the railroad itself that determines, like, you know, what its standards are for reporting. Like, I mean, that was a real big bombshell, and, and it's a really important sort of side to the story. But what I want to impress upon people is that the video, the TikTok video that, that uh, Paul is talking about, the, the, 
points that he's making about those hot box detectors and why the public needs to know about them. Uh, like again, at these at these official federal hearings that have just happened in the past month, where Norfolk Southern has admitted to these, that's the same shit that that Paul was saying in the TikTok that he has now been fired for. So it's and, like, and, and we're gonna use, we're gonna actually they use that TikTok in their formal hearing against. Well, you know what? Let's let's t let's pause real quick. Let's let's uh, let's tee up that TikTok just so everyone listening uh, knows exactly what we're talking about. So we're gonna play that clip and then uh, and then we'll hop back here in two minutes. This is a hot box detector. It's a device that inspects train axles for overheated bearings, like the one that caused the East Palestine derailment. As a train passes over one of these devices, it scans each bearing and gives the crew an exit message over the radio like this. EOP detector, milepost 6.3, no defects, total axle 6, 1, 9, temperature 2, 5 degrees, detector out. The no defects message ensures the crew that all temperature readings are normal. Those detectors are usually placed about every 15 or 20 miles along the route, but over the last couple of years, these monopoly railroads have shut off the alert messages on much of the system. Crews used to be alerted over the radio when a detector found a hot bearing. Now crews are being kept in the dark as to the true status of their train. Now when a detector senses a rising bearing temperature, an alert is sent to the railroading dispatch center, which is hundreds of miles away, and not to the crew. A manager or other useless middleman reviews the message but usually allows the train to proceed. Now, if the bearing temperature continues to rise on future detectors, the crew's finally alerted that a bearing is trending hot and the crew now knows to stop and inspect their train. Meanwhile, the train has traveled who knows how many miles since the first detector saw the problem. This practice has stripped away the ability to take corrective action by the crew, keeping trains with problems moving, and surely has saved the railroads money to buy back more of their own shares but at East Palestine, their luck gambling with public safety seems to have run out. This is the route the train was following in the miles prior to the derailment. At Salem, a video caught the train passing as fire engulfed the wheel bearing. Also at Salem, a hotbox detector inspected the bearings on the train. The crew was not alerted to any problem. Now had the detector given an exit message alerting the crew to the presence of a hot bearing, they would have stopped the train immediately and inspected. Instead, the unaware crew continued on east to East Palestine where the next detector was located. But as we all know, by this time it was too late for the crew to take corrective action, and the bearing failed, derailing the train, and causing an environmental disaster along a river which provides 10% of Americans drinking water. Why was the detector at Salem not working correctly to alert the crew? Why are the railroads allowed to silence safety devices? Logically, there are only two scenarios which could have played out. Either one, the detector at Salem had maintenance problems and was not working, in which case they need to be held liable for gross negligence. Or two, the detector worked just fine, but the hot bearing message went to the dispatching center in Atlanta instead of the crew, and the, and the train continued on, in which case the company needs to be held liable for gross negligence. It's time that Americans asked why giant unaccountable monopolies are allowed to own, neglect, and dominate our vital rail infrastructure while buying, buying back billions of dollars of their own shares every year. Railroad workers have warned of the cuts to maintenance, longer trains, and utter contempt these companies hold for the general public. East Palestine will happen again if we continue to allow these companies to be unaccountable. Again, like you guys can see why the rail carriers are so focused on silencing people like Paul, why they are so intent on creating this culture of fear among its workers that makes it so difficult for media makers and journalists like myself to connect with their workers to get these kinds of stories and to learn about the real issues going on in this industry and how uh, those issues endanger workers, how they hurt the economy, and how they put uh, us citizens and our communities at hazard, right? I mean, like, this is... Um 
you know, like like if, if the public knows about these things, then we're going to start rightfully demanding that this industry be more tightly regulated, that um, the business practices of the major rail carriers be more tightly regulated, or even as we've uh, talked about over at The Real News, uh, you know, even perhaps like we should uh, take the railroads into public ownership. This is a proposal that Railroad Workers United has been uh, pushing for and and, um, you know, the rail carriers who are raking in record profits, of course they don't want that. So, like, they're going to do everything that they can to sort of um, create that that culture and that environment in which this vital information does not make its way out to the public. And anyone like Paul who uh, puts their neck out there to try to get that information to the public uh, is going to be is going to face swift and severe uh, repercussions for that. And like, I really want to stress that, you know, in this country, we, we, we have, you know, a, a, a important tradition uh, of whistleblowing. We associate that tradition with, you know, great patriots like Daniel Ellsberg, uh, Edward Snowden, W. Mark Felt, a.k.a. Deep Throat, Chelsea Manning. Julian Assange. I mean, people who, you know, like brought information to the public that the public needed to know. But we tend to think of that in terms of like exposing like government lies. And that's the only realm in which like whistleblowing is applicable. No, there are tons of statutes protecting uh, workers under whistleblowing uh, provisions um, who workers who take that step to, uh, yeah, alert authorities, the media uh, about safety um, uh, issues about violations that are going unreported. Like, again, you know, whistleblower protections mean that, like, information that the public has a right to know and needs to know um, that is being actively suppressed, that that um, people who are trying to get that information out are being retaliated against. Like, we have all of these whistleblower provisions uh, to try to protect from those things. But, like, you can very much be a whistleblower in an industry like the railroads, like if you are a rank and file worker, or even a manager, like in many ways, you could call Chris Smalls a whistleblower, right? He led a walkout at that Amazon warehouse in in uh, Queens over the company's like safety, uh, COVID safety protocols, right? That is blowing the whistle. That is saying to your coworkers and to the public, something is going on here that is in violation of the law, that is in violation of basic, uh, you know, laws of civilization and humanity, and people need to know about. It, right. Like that is what we're sort of talking about here. And this is the kind of stuff that Paul was bravely and rightly and necessarily bringing to public view. But when the, the, the public started turning its eye to the railroads, especially after East Palestine, the carriers, you know, they, they wanted to stamp that out however they possibly could. And here we are now with Paul uh, 17 years on the railroad um, being ended because of that service service that he has done to us and to this country. And and it's not just me, just, just so you know, I've, I've been in contact with others. This is pure brute force intimidation. Uh, there have been people that have had my videos or other videos that people have made on the railroads uh, on their phone or had been messaged it by someone else and the railroad found out about it and fired them permanently for just for having this content. Jesus. You kidding so, me? I mean, no, that is serious. that is insane. Yeah, and and um, like you said, you know, everyone has it should have the right to be able to call out uh, this unethical behavior, behavior from these companies that violates, you know, basic societal norms, safety. Um, but the problem is, these whistleblower laws were really written in an age prior to social media, and social media has become the primary form of news exchange. And so my goal has always been to result, uh, to create legislative change on the railroad industry up to including, like you mentioned, public ownership, which is a de definitely a misunderstood issue. Um, uh, but legislative change, and the only way to get legislative change is to alert the public so that they can alert their lawmakers to, uh, to make legislative change. And in 
past generations that would have been through you know rallies or the newspaper or something but that era is gone the way people do that now is via social media and so the laws need to reflect that social media is protected speech and these companies will argue that oh we're a private company the first amendment that doesn't apply to private companies will then quit taking federal funding as long as you guys take federal paycheck protection loans and preferential fed loans and any assistance because you don't want to maintain your infrastructure yourself so you want to take federal or state loans or grants or anything stop sucking on the tit, the tit of government and stand on your own two feet and don't be too big to fail if you want to be separate. Otherwise, you're essentially a wing of, of government if you're going to take money from the government. And yes, I have First Amendment rights to talk out against you. At least that's my thoughts. Fucking hey, man. Yeah, <laughs> say preach, man. I think that's exactly right. And I know that that was, uh, uh, you made a really great point back in September when we were talking about the, the potential rail shutdown, right? And, and we were talking about the Presidential Emergency Board report from August and how the rail carriers infamously said that workers like yourself, uh, you know, bore none of the risk of the uh, uh, the rail industry and thus were entitled to none of the rewards. And you rightly pointed out, you're like, oh, so all that money you guys got from Trump's tax cuts, like, was yes. that risk or reward, <laughs> right? Was that you taking a risk? Well, yeah, was that risk or was that investment? I'm confused. Yeah, it was. And their, their quote was as follows. The carriers maintain that it was their risk and investment that resulted in their profits and not any contribution by labor. And that's just amazing because labor is the one that can, ones that contribute their finite lives and existence on this planet and risk their safety and their times away from their family and children and everything else. Um, and meanwhile, we're the ones that get taxed the most. And uh, there were certain people that had, um, you know, major disagreements with this union contract. Um, but I had one in particular that really, really rubs me the wrong way. And I've mentioned it a bunch. Uh, for some reason, it just hasn't stuck with the union, even though I talked to the president of the BLE, Dennis Pierce, back when he was the president and everything else. The union has not been on our side on this issue. And that is taxation on meals when you travel out of town. If you're out of town a couple hundred days a year traveling there, you bear an immense expense on having to eat out because you don't have the choice. And people could say, oh, well, just bring your lunch. What, are you going to bring a cold lunch 200 days a year? What kind of life is that? Sometimes you eat away from home, and it costs a lot more money. It's a lot more expensive than eating at home. So uh, it used to be that you could write off that expense at the end of the year, but the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act took that ability away when they uh, changed the way that all that is calculated. So now railroaders can't really write that off anymore. Um, so they lost their biggest tax deduction and the railroads do not pay a proper daily per diem. So the IRS says, uh, I believe it's $60 a day now is when you travel out of town is the portion of your pay that is to be uh, paid to you tax free as a reimbursement where you don't pay taxes on it. Instead, we get $12 because it hasn't gone up since the 90s, $12 to be gone for two days. And that affects your adjusted gross income. It results in higher taxation. Meanwhile, those companies and billionaires alike, they, <laughs> they don't pay hardly anything in taxes because everything is written off as a write-off. Because if you're a business, you can write off everything in the world, but workers don't get that ability. So that's what really, really bothers me. And, and I do intimately understand how that's calculated. I've run you know, little businesses of my own. I have a business degree. I understand the taxes and I understand how much railroaders are getting screwed. And, and it doesn't just apply to railroaders. It applies to any company that doesn't uh, pay a proper per diem for their workers, you know? Yeah. No, I think, I think like, that's again, really powerfully put and spot on, man. I mean, like it just yet another example, right. Of how workers like yourself are bearing the costs of, you know, the, the, this industry. 
and and the the executives and shareholders are reaping all the rewards and they still have the gall to tell Biden's presidential emergency board that you, that you guys are taking none of the risk right that that and thus like you know you you deserve none of the shares of their record profits it's just sickening frankly and and like i i know i can't keep you much longer and i want to sort of round the final turn here i mean we got so much more to talk about but i just wanted to really put in a plea to everyone listening right we're going to link to other past interviews and uh that that Paul and I have done uh, pieces that he's written. We're going to link to his TikTok. Like, please get these out there as much as you can. Make sure people know about, A, what Paul has been trying to make the public aware of in terms of the rail industry and its destructive business practices and what that is doing to the workers, to the infrastructure, and to our communities. So please, please help us get the word out about that. But also... Please help us get the word out about uh, Paul being retaliated against and fired from all like three three times. So we're, this is what we're going to end talking about. You know, like we're, we're, I'm not going to be able to ask Paul about anything regarding like uh, pending litigation. Um, you know, so so please just um, bear with us there. Um, and of course, you know, we got to like. With the with the way that the the law in this country moves so slowly and how much it favors uh, the bosses already, we got to be careful and say like you know, allegedly in retaliation for you know his whistle blowing. I mean like, but to me, everything that we are seeing and hearing about, uh, and given Paul's like existing record on the railroads, like it seems pretty damn obvious to me um, that he was targeted and retaliated against and fired for his whistleblowing, and um, should be and 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 should have the same whistleblower protections that this country claims that uh, that we have. And so, Paul, I guess like take us around the final term, man. Like tell us about. Uh, you know, what has happened with these firings, how you are doing, um, and, and what people can do to stand in solidarity with you. Okay. Well, yeah, February 24th was my last work day and I've always had really good rapport with my local managers, get along fine with them and everything. And I don't, they personally, I don't think, uh, personally wanted anything to do with this. But on that day, after working a whole shift and all, I came into the yard office and they said, well, yeah, Omaha called and we're supposed to escort you off the property. That was my last work day. And it's amazing the time period on it because it's right when the media is just exploding over East Palestine. Um, and then also another derailment that had happened in Southern California where an excessive tonnage train that had broken in half got away and derailed at 145 miles an hour. And I, they, um, so at some point, someone in Omaha decided to uh, pull the pin and ca- make the call and silence me on that. And um, they held five of my TikTok videos, held a formal investigation over my, my videos, um, played them. And I, I think it's funny. I also think it's kind of hilarious that off the record, the UP managers agreed with me on it and, and they were quite impressed with the amount of views of it. But of course they couldn't put that on the record <laughs> for it. But, um, yeah, they held three formal investigations. Now, um, so well, one on that, right? So that's where it gets really interesting. So remember how I said, this is an industry that has people in the background that makes calls and they will smear and destroy the reputation and credibility of anyone that they see standing up against them. So it's bad enough. They held, uh, an investigation, a formal hearing on this, um, that probably would have been overturned by the, uh, arbitrator when they looked at it. Well, they want to, multiply that times three to see if an arbitrator will overturn it three times because I referred to myself in the investigation just as I think any worker right now would feel toward these corrupt billionaire employers. And that is I referred to myself as feeling like a slave to 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 my work, to my industry, right? And they didn't like that. And so they held another formal investigation a few weeks later to fire me again for saying that I used a racial slur to talk about myself when I was referring to myself as being a slave to their company. And Fuck then they, off, man. Yeah, <laughs> and, and then they held a third one that day that I didn't even know was going on 
uh, until afterwards, we went straight into another formal hearing so that they could bring one more TikTok video that I'd posted into the mix, this time about the SEMA derailment and the train d- leaving the rails doing 140 miles an hour, right? Um, so they fire, they hold three separate formal investigations, one on the original first five TikTok videos, the next for me calling myself a slave to them, and the next for another TikTok video so that they can ensure that I'm silenced and can never be brought back to work by an arbitrator is what they're trying to do. And it's unprecedented and it's unheard of in the industry. I don't know that anyone in the industry that's dealt with uh, the union and formal investigations like that has ever seen someone investigated three times in regard to the same exact charge. I'm like, I'm at a loss for words with that. That is, that is insane to me. And I think, yeah, like, um, they blackballed me from the industry too there, Max. I've applied to multiple positions on Amtrak since then as a qualified engineer with a lot of good years of service. And I'm not getting any response from anybody because they blackballed me by essentially saying that, you know, if you you look at my service record now, now it shows that apparently I use racial slurs for referring to calling myself a slave. That is, I mean, like that, I don't know what part to be more angry about. I mean, but obviously that part... I'm very fucking angry about because like, I mean, this, this is just so cynical and, and so like <laughs> diabolical, right? Like to, to, when you are talking about a worker who has given 17 years of their life to this industry, who knows, you know, their job inside and out, who takes that work incredibly seriously, right? And, you know, is is raising the alarm about serious issues within that industry that are endangering workers, endangering communities, and ultimately, you know, like hurting the economy uh, and the industry itself, right? So you have that situation, and amidst, you know, the, the, the kind of other sort of dynamics we've talked about in the industry that have led this industry to pile so much work onto so few workers, to treat workers like crap, to constantly push people to, uh, you know, be on call, uh, to, to devote every waking hour of their lives to this industry, so on and so forth. Like, yeah, I can tell you firsthand as someone who's interviewed many railroad workers that they have also described to me that they feel like slaves to this industry, because how else would you describe it when you are a conductor and engineer, uh, working under like these oppressive draconian, uh, attendance policies that mean that you have to be on call 24 seven seven days a week, 365 days out of the year. You can't plan your life. You don't have paid sick days, although some may now finally be getting a few paid sick days, but that didn't apply to conductors and engineers, by the way. Well, there you go. So then you're still fucked. So like if you, so you don't have the ability to take paid sick days, like you were literally at the beck and call of your employer. If you miss those calls, you are fired, you lose your paycheck, you lose all your accrued benefits, so on and so forth. So yeah, I, I wholeheartedly understand it when you and other workers say you feel like slaves in this industry because that is the position you've been put in. And then for the company to turn around and say, well, we're going to fire you for saying that because by calling yourself a slave, that's a racial slur. And then in turn for you to be blackballed from the industry because you have this company written note on your record saying that allegedly like, you know, you have a history of, or you were fired for like racist comment, like that, pardon my French, but that is fucking bullshit it is and this is the same industry i'll say again that literally oppressed blacks by holding them in low-paying porters and waiter positions until not that long ago preventing them from being conductors and engineers i mean this company is the most morally bankrupt company in the world historically and now they want to pretend that they have some sort of moral high ground to stand on it's it's just amazing yeah (laughs) yeah man i mean like we like it's funny you mentioned that or not so funny i mean like but if people go back to the our own show catalog two months ago i interviewed brian mack a black conductor for csx 
who was also fired under very dubious circumstances that feel to me pretty racially motivated. And Brian himself talked about, you know, uh, uh, what it was like for him to be a second generation black railroader. You can hear him describe in his dad's experience, like trying to make a career amidst that kind of racist uh, uh, regime that Paul was just describing that when he says that wasn't too long ago, like you can hear that in the interview that we did with Brian Mack just a couple months ago. And, 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 and like, Again, I, I know we got to wrap this up. I know I got to let you go, but it's just like, again, like this is what we're dealing with here. Like to to not only not address the serious issues that Paul was communicating when he says, "I feel like a slave to this industry," instead of addressing the issues that are leading your workers to feel that way, you fire them and sm like smear them in this way to try to send a message to anyone else who dare speak out. Like that is ultimately what we're talking about here. That is why it's so important for all of us to not let them get away with this, not let them push this under the rug, not let these issues just sort of fade from our memory until the next East Palestine or Lock Megantic happens. I am begging people to... And it's going to happen. Yeah. Like, it's not like it's not like derailments just stopped after East Palestine. We just haven't had one as catastrophic since then. We, we um, just had that derailment in Montana. Did you see the bridge collapse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. So uh, that is our infrastructure. That is our infrastructure that money doesn't go back into. That money goes back into share buybacks. It doesn't go into maintaining stuff like that. And I can tell you uh, personally, and I hope the railroad is listening to this, but when I was down at my dad's recently, he lives right next to a bridge along a line in California that Amtrak uses every single day. And the pilings under that bridge are disgusting and falling apart. And it's probably in just as bad a condition as that bridge in Montana. Jesus, man. Yeah. Like this, this is like this, this, this is a crisis that that kind of destruction of the railroads took years of neglect and greedy practices. And it's not like we can just turn a switch and fix them. There are things we can do now. We could like, you know, Biden and Congress could could make those trains half the size tomorrow. Like if they if they were really adamant about, you know, like intervening here, like there are immediate things you can do while making long term investments to improve upon uh, the issues that Paul and I've been talking about for nearly the past two hours. But, um, you know, we, again, it's going to take that will. It's going to take all of us kind of forcing our elected officials uh, to make it an, a priority, forcing the media to continue to cover it. Um, and yes, speaking up, speaking out for those who can't speaking up um, and 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 letting companies like Union Pacific know what you think about how they're treating their workers and how they're treating whistleblowers like Paul. Um, please do whatever you can to to spread this Paul story, to hold these companies accountable, and to to do whatever you can to to make this better because it's not going to get better on its own. And so on that final note, Paul, again, I wanted to thank you so much, man, for, for sharing all of this. And again, I'm so sorry that you were going through all of this bullshit. And I just wanted to ask one final question by way of rounding out how you're doing and, and what people out there can do to support you as you go through this. Um, personally, you know, I'm, I'm doing pretty well. I, I was, I try to be a few years ago, I acknowledged that I, I can't be a hundred percent reliant on the railroad. So I tried to manage my finances and everything to where they're not hurting me. And I've been traveling around and finally trying to work on my health and just, you know, doing some things I've wanted to do for a long time. Um, I am concerned about my, uh, health insurance eventually running out, they have an extension program where it goes on for a bit, but, um, you know, it'll, it'll eventually run out, which is, um, another one of those, it goes back to my comment on why I felt that I was a slave of the railroad. Um, so, you know, just a little reminder to everyone where we live in a country where if you're employed by one of these big companies that likes to engage in dubious activity, um, and you say anything about them, they can literally kill you. I mean, I've, I've got uh, obstructive sleep apnea from my time at the railroad, and I'm on blood pressure medication now, and they're taking my health insurance away. So all because I decided to speak out against them. That is 
that would definitely be another issue that I know, Max, you've probably covered, um, you know, the issue of health insurance in this country. Um, but in the meantime, that's not quite there yet. So I'm doing okay and traveling around. But um, I, I, I think that everyone that wants to, they need to stay engaged into what's going on here. And, uh, you know, it kind of relates to the, the TikTok thing. Don't allow people to talk about how TikTok needs to be banned. Don't allow them to, don't allow your mind to believe this crap that they're trying to put out there. People get their news, their unbiased news from passionate creators on outlets like TikTok. And, um, you know, banning TikTok is a way that they can shut down that, that information stream and keep following people that are having, you know, the nerve and braveness to stand up and, and make content about, uh, about these issues. And, uh, you know, don't, don't forget about it because it's going to affect every one, of, every one of us. And especially with whistleblowing, it doesn't matter what the industry, this potentially could result in some sort of jurisprudence that is used in the future for generations to come that states that social media is a form of free speech. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.